here we go. All right, we're back here. This is round two. It's really going great. Introduce yourself. Oh, I am Anne Submissan and Robin Pacino. And she named that by watching a movie with Al Pacino and Robin Williams. Took so both first and last. And this is part two, and we'll keep going. Okay. So, so we were talking about Sophia Loren and, uh, yeah, and engaging and, and, people. Um, so yeah, well, I, I'm attracted. You. I'm attracted to interesting people. Right. Are you kidding? A woman like that, the life she's led, the oh, things well, she's done. Oh no! Done. Don't get me wrong. I mean, but it's just that she was so beautiful and so sexy. Well, the sexiest woman that ever that ever lived, I really believe, mm -hmm. was Anna Mangani. I don't know if you saw the rose tattoo, or she did the future of Carmen Marlon Brando. Anthony Quinn said that was the sexiest woman he ever met. And Anthony Francioso, I, who I knew, he told me too, that was the sexiest woman he ever met. And, when, and oh, why, what did they say about that? What was sexy about it? Because it wasn't raw just sex. raw sex. She yeah, emulated a, primal. She wasn't good looking. You know, uh -huh. really. She didn't have a, a model's body. She had a, a woman's body. Uh -huh. You know, that's, and then it was just, if you ever saw the rose tattoo when she put on a full slip, I fell in love with full slips because the movie came out in the 50s. Uh -huh. And I've been in love. I mean, th just something about her when you look at her. She was the type of woman that she said, when she looked at you, she was telling you, I'm going to fuck you. And that was it. And there's nothing you could do about it. <laughs> Nothing. That's great. That's great. It really, you know. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's just mind boggling. It's funny when you talk about when you how you got into the business of porn. I was in, I was away, and, and I come out. I was on work release from Sing Sing, a prison in New York. Mm -hmm. And I was still on parole. I was doing a play. I was playing a psychiatrist. And after the play, somebody asked me if I wanted to do a porno. Oh my! This is 1977. Oh my! So. I said, sure, why not? Mm -hmm. And I went down and I did it. But what they did, they put me in with this a newcomer, mm -hmm. and I was a newcomer, and I tried to get to know her beforehand. Uh -huh. She didn't want to do that. She wanted to be, she said, no, let's, I want to be professional. And, and it, it didn't work out, but I would have loved to have tried it. You know, I have no end of, you know, whatever I do, I don't see the camera. I'm not aware of the camera. Oh, no, no, don't focus on the camera. No, I look at the person that, that I'm, I'm engaged with. That's, that's odd, because in all the ones that I did, the, the gentlemen would come and they'd introduce themselves and, and we would chat a little bit. You know, like you're getting your hair done and your makeup done, getting ready for the thing, and they would always be like, oh gosh, I'm so excited to be here with you. And I would always, always want them to feel that they were, they were my Adonis, you know, for the next couple of hours because um, you got paid, um, it wasn't by the hour, it, it was paid, no, you know, for the, the for the deal. So for me, being a businesswoman, I wanted to shoot my video and, and be done. And so, and shooting my video was going to depend on this male being erect and being attracted to me and so I did everything I could to have him feel that the sun you know rose and set in his cock for me you know for the next few hours I never knew any of the gentlemen you know before or afterwards but during that time during the time that we were together they were it that's it well that's what you know I was looking for that well, I mean, too bad you weren't there when I was. Struck. I know. But uh, who knows? I, instead of being a, instead of being in Charles Brunson movies, I might have been in John Holmes movies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, I, I have not. You know, I, I'm very free. I'm very open, and uh, and uh, as I said, I've always had that fascination. Well, like in Greenwich Village, I knew I hung out on a lesbian wall. Uh huh. It's called Kelly's Village West. It was a great place to get laid because, of, like you said, bi, bi. I always found bi women wanted a man. Not, you know, they claimed to be lesbian, but they did want the real thing at times. And there was no strings attached. 
You know what I'm saying? I think that you found a woman who decided they wanted to do you. Yes, not, right. Not that they, you know, by women, by women means that they like pussy and they like cock. Yeah. Um, I think that, and I've met a lot of women um, who've wanted to have relationships with me. And I've always been like, well, you don't understand, you know, I would always, I would always want a cock. And I've found that lesbian women are very open mm -hmm. to the idea that if they're going to accept you, that occasionally you're going to want to go that's, date a yeah, man. I guess that's the point, I, yeah. I found that very much. Because, you yeah, remember, this is 1967 in Greenwich Village, when it was all make love. It was a great time. I was going to acting. Well, school. it was a time where we went, we shifted, you know, from where you weren't supposed to lose your virginity before getting okay. married. That that yeah. was the fifties, you know. I, mean, you I know, had to tell you, I loved it before I could even touch your breast. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, you know, unless you're one of those bad women, those wicked women. Well, I always um, found the, the ones that dressed sexy were the ones that weren't given it. It was the ones that looked like they were going to Catholic school. They were the ones that were the sexiest. They were ready to go to bed with you. You know, the ones that we used to call, you know, C-teasers, cock-teasers. You know, the ones that were the real, that's when short shorts first came out in this and that. Uh-huh. Uh, those, I, I, you know, you look at them, that's all they wanted you to do. They didn't want you to touch them. The ones I met a lot of them like that. It was the Catholic school girls, the ones with the eyeglasses and the geeks, you know. I guess that's why I still like girls in glasses. <laughs> uh, you know, always, 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 you know, the studious people. Uh, there's no big, like when I was in high school, there was no big line for them. But, oh my God, you could do the most fantastic, outrageous things, you know. What I, I, what I used to do in high school was that um, at the math and physics conferences, things like that, I would find some guy that was, you know, just a brain, just, you know, won the awards, right? And approach them and get to know them. And no pretty girl ever talks to them. And so I would get them to tutor me so that I could understand math or physics or whatever their thing was. I, you know, explain it to me better than the public school system was, you know. So I could go back to class and I could look like I actually knew what I was, you know, that I knew what was going on because I did, because I had someone explain it to me, right? And in exchange, uh -huh. I, um, yeah. Those, those were my boyfriends. Those were the guys I, I dated. <laughs> you were smart. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, women, uh, that's impressive, really. You knew early on what you wanted and you went and got it. Yeah. And you still do. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it was the thing is that my grandmother, you know, she really pressured me into getting married because she was very, very afraid that I would get older yeah. and I would be alone and I'd have to support myself and, you know, da 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 da, -da like being afraid for me. And, um, and the truth is, is that I really have no problem um, getting sex when I want sex, be it with a woman or a man or a trans person or cross-dresser or whatever, you know, if, you're, if I'm interested in you, uh, somehow they're interested in me, and um, and I I'm perfectly capable of supporting myself, you know. So grannies don't always know. Not always. Well, I think times yeah. change. Of maybe. course, well, back then. But, but it was out of her love for me sure. and like that. But yeah, no. Did your parents know what you do today, or are they still alive? Um. They know, do you know my parents? My mom is still alive. My mom knows. And do you get any repercussions or they accept it? Where are you from originally? 
I'm from the Bay Area. Oh, because I saw you up there. I, uh, I'm, uh, I grew up on Park Street in Alameda. And then we, I also lived, uh, oh gosh, in um, Hayward and Castro Valley and San Francisco. So and that's very open, the way of life. You don't uh, realize like what it's like to be there uh, or, or in that area. Uh, at the time that I was growing up until you meet people out of that area uh -huh. and that, that was a and I went to school I went to college in California so it was still not so not so much a culture shock as uh, as going to some other places and how they how they think about things yeah well actually San Francisco was like Greenwich Village just larger yeah, because Greenwich Village is a small part of Manhattan. Right, and it was, it was like a whole new world. I mean, it, it, once you left 12th Street, you know, you were out of the village. And, you know, that's one thing I like about New York. I, I was born there. I mean, as an actor, you, you got Broadway, and you go a couple blocks you away. You can you're walk out of there. all of Manhattan. Well, I always did walk. Uh, no, you didn't need a car, you had to be crazy. Right. Uh, I, it was, I didn't have a car in the Bay Area either. I didn't. You got a lot of hills there. Oh no, I like uh -huh. walked, I walked them, I rode my bike. Um, Bart went in when I was in junior high school in ninth grade. And um, I remember they took us on a field trip to the station they were completing. And they were like, oh, in the fall this is going to open up and it's 50 cents to take, you know, this train through the tunnel to San Francisco. And I'm like looking at it and I'm like, uh, let, let me get this right, you know, so in a couple months I can spend 50 cents and I can take, you know, a 12 minute, 15 minute ride to San Francisco anytime I want. Okay. Because <laughs> I was over in San Leandro at the time, so I was across the bay. I wonder what it costs now, though, to take that train. I have no idea, but it's still, it's like, you know, there, there is no holding us in place, you know, at that point. And the whole feeling of, um, you know, with transportation, you know, the biggest arguments I got in, I was raised by my grandma. And the biggest arguments I got in were about the phone uh -huh. because we had these things called message units. So you had a local call and then everything else had message units. So if you called like Walnut Creek, remember my boyfriends were the smart guys that won the test. So I wanted to make these message unit calls. They weren't local calls. and. Um, Oh my God, it, it, they were like 20 cents a message unit or something like that. So if you talked for 10 minutes, all of a sudden you had like a $50 bill or something. It, I mean, it was horrible. Right. And now you have cell phones, cell phones, you talk all over the world. It's a non-existent, you know, argument. It's Can't even find a pay phone. Right, it's hard to find a pay phone. So you would never have a an argument with your parent about how expensive the phone was. You, it would be more about data than it would be about actual calling of people. And everybody has a phone. It's like everybody has a television in every room. Right, at that time we, we, we had a, a rotary phone. Right. <laughs> you dialed it. It was on, uh, ours was on the wall, although you could get one that would sit down. And, uh, and there was no, um, I remember when, um, when I was growing up, there was no answering machine. No. You had to be, in the 50s they had those songs about waiting by the phone because if you didn't wait by the phone, you weren't getting the phone call. Me, it's like, if a guy didn't show up within 20 minutes of me and he was supposed to be there, I was out. You know, gone. Really? Oh yeah, forget that. You know, yeah, I, had, true, I had friends, I had things to do, you could go find me later. Uh, the other thing was transportation. The idea of distance. My grandmother thought that driving from San Leandro to Berkeley or to San Francisco was far. That was a special, special event. Uh -huh. And for me, 
Um, yeah, so before I got out of high school, I could take BART everywhere in the Bay Area and across to San Francisco. I just did not get her idea of distance and why she thought it was so significant. Now people, people ride airplanes like they're buses now. You know, you take airplanes to work, you know, there's, there are people that commute years by ago, airplane. Could, they've gone up, I mean, years ago when you could get a flight from here to New York for $99. You know, round trip sometimes. Oh my God! And I remember Eastern Airlines. You could mail them a check. Didn't have to be a good check. <laughs> you didn't do that. <laughs> Say me. it isn't no, so. so. And you can get first class round trip tickets mailed to you. This is back in the early '80s. So oh in, wow! In New York, yeah. I mean, everything has really changed so much now. I mean, back then you could get you know, the illegal box for your cable so you can get everything, get the porn stations and everything. Today you can't do that, I mean, you know, yeah, they, yeah, you they, they, they figured today. out these things. <laughs> it, used to be, it used to be when ATMs first came out, no. you, could, you could withdraw the money at the branch, you could go outside to the ATM and withdraw the same money, you could then yeah, drive to the nearest other up, ATM and get the, same money. And get the same money if your rent was due. Yeah. Not that as a musician I ever needed to do that, <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, poor struggling artists, we seem to we know. Knew it all, yeah. all we, we did. You talk about the phones. I remember the pay phones. I could take the bobby pin and stick it in and, and hit it and you would get a dial tone. Oh my gosh. This is, yeah, back in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> we, used to, we used to put bingo chips in the parking medias. I remember they, that. Because they were 10 cents. I mean, now they're, what, a dollar out here? You know, for... Uh, now they take credit cards. Credit cards, yes, out here. I know. Is that like... It's, it's, it's uh, wild. I think it's wild. The first time I put a, a that commercial, credit card... we come a long way, baby. I know. We have. We have. And you really, now... I mean, I mean, like your, your business is really with the internet and Craigslist. I don't know if you're on Craigslist or whatever. No, don't do Craigslist. You yeah. won't find me there. So the things that what I'm I saying do. Is, is it's so, there's so much information there's, out there. There is a lot of Easy information. To find you. Um, so I do modeling, I do fetish erotic and BDSM and severe bondage modeling. Uh, isn't that wild that at 59 you can still do all of that? And no one would ever take you for 59, that's the thing. Especially when I looked at your photos, and I, I, it was, she looks about 25, 30 years old. I uh, mean, there's no way so that anyone... So sweet. And, and it's all natural, too. You look almost you know, like you're all natural. Oh, no, I bought these. You but but they're mine. <laughs> Come to the store box. <laughs> um, well, you know, that was the thing, was that, uh, so I got them when I was 50, uh, that was my present, and uh, I had great big areolas, and so my breasts were like a bee cup, and my areola was like half of my breast, you know, so what I did was basically I got it so that they were lifted up because I had had two children and I had breastfed well, them yeah, sure. and so they got lifted up and filled out and uh, I have loved them every single day any woman um, who you know today's topless day all over the world oh my gosh uh, the 24th of August I, I posted it quite a bit on uh, Facebook imagine it's, that it's, it's topless and I put a men too <laughs> Men's but chests are very sexy. Yes. I, I, it's oh. it's incredible that it's okay for men to go around being sexy chested. <laughs> and here, you know, and in Europe, they're not not they don't care. They so don't much. care. Really. Well, it, I don't think over here we look at a woman's breast is is more sexual than where a man's is not. You know what I'm saying? I mean, a woman's breast is always... I don't think to gay men that men's chests yeah. are not sexual. Uh, I think they're very That's sexual. different, but it's always been... In Europe, it's... I, well, Europe always said they still wear Speedos and that to the beach. And, 
Oh yeah. You know, I mean, you know, nude beach. I love being. I love being naked. I, I was in high school. I loved water polo because you have these guys that, oh my God, they have to exercise forever in order to do this sport, and they're wearing their little speedos. <laughs> water polo. I, yes. I am. I am surprised that water polo isn't more popular because, oh my God, yeah, it's yeah. fabulous. Their yeah, bodies are fabulous. There's nothing like a wet woman. <laughs> in the world, in, in right? so in many world. ways. In so many ways. Yeah. <laughs> but I, my, I remember I fell in love with a girl in back in the Bronx when she was swimming. It was the most beautiful thing I ever saw in my life. Was her in the water. I think that's why they have all of those shower scenes in movies. Mm -hmm. You know. I mean, it's just something so so erotic about it. Angelina Jolie and the Tomb Raider. I think she does a, a shower scene. And you know, I never really found her sexy and I met her. Outside of, I always believe, you know, she had beautiful, incredibly look, beautiful lips. Like Sophie Loren lips. Nobody had, you know, I mean, those uh -huh. like lips. But I never really found her sexy. I haven't so, met yeah. her personally, so my vote is out. But I really, um, I find her fascinating. And, uh, and I find... The fact that her and Brad make a difference with her money. Well, that's something different. But I'm talking about fascinating too. Sexually, I mean, I was. She never it wasn't one of them like Sophie Loren or some of the others that turn you on. She never turned me on. I uh, said her lips. I don't know. Maybe because I know her father. <laughs> oh, you know that might have something to do with it. You know, you, know, John, <laughs> you you just can't can't divorce yourself from that. Not only that, but John would be like in your face, "You're fucking my daughter." Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, I would never. You know, I could never do that. I, I don't fool with married women. I tell you, you get shot that way. You know, I'm very old fashioned about something. You know, it's the Italian to me, and I just, I grew up. Uh, there was a movie called Seven Up. It's about organized crime. Uh huh. And those are the guys that arrested me. The real ones. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. Oh my. So I I did like sixteen years. Oh, I didn't. I so, no idea. And uh, you know I. I mean I have those respects. I never fool around with you know somebody else's wife or anything like that. And it's disrespectful. You know, there's plenty of women out there that you can have. That's true. You know, and then you know, I always believe in doing the right thing. Sometimes, though, there are people now that have open marriages. Well, that's the difference, though. I used to go to, I remember that back in the, I was uh, work release from prison back in the, in the late 70s. And uh, I would go to these swing parties. Uh huh. This woman used to take me, there was a place called Plato's Retreat in New York. Mm -hmm. It was a big, big. Sex, you know, everybody had sex. Yeah, yeah. Over at um, a club in LA, the uh, Sanctuary LAX, on uh, the first oh, yeah, Saturday yeah. of every month, they have a great big swingers party. I heard about the, the I know a few people. Uh, I had them on as guests, any of my show. I, I friended them to you, and they, they could have, you know, I was very into that. When I, when I left there, these sex parties, I always wanted to be with somebody I cared. You know, there you go, fuck, I want to go make love to somebody. That I well, care that's about. the thing, is that when you go fuck someone, you totally, totally now understand what it is to make love to someone. Right, right. That's, that's, <laughs> you know, you know yeah. and do you know uh, TED.com? It's, it's an internet um, site where they have researchers and they have, re you know, scientists and researchers on every topic including sex and so one of them was this um, presentation about how they had done like an MRI of the human brain mm -hmm. yeah. and when you come it lights up every center of your brain like physically that's that's what happens and so it's like getting an electrical charge. This is why coming is really, really good for you. You should do it every day, whether you masturbate um, or you have sex with someone else coming. You actually reach, you know, it lights up your brain. It lights up all the centers. It, it physically is good for you. And the difference between um, sex with a random person or yourself 
at sex with someone that you love is that it's the only time that it lights up the memory center. Oh, interesting. And so phys there's a physical difference, and what that is is that you make a memory. And I think intuitively inside yourself, it's like you've always known there was a difference. Well, there is. Sure. Well, I, I find, you know, it's funny. My nephew years ago, when it came to masturbation, I told him, it's all right. But I said, just before you climax, stand on your toes. <laughs> That's only good if, in but the fact man, that for a man, I, yeah. people actually bend their toes and they either curl them or they bend them out. And you can actually stop a person from climaxing by figuring out which way their toes bend and then tying them, you know, with tape or that's rope or something. Well, that's not this. This you get a greater climax. Actually. If you if you stand on your toes. Just about yeah, just about you start the climax. Uh -huh. Man, I told him stand on your toes and, just, and you'll have an incredible orgasm. Probably even if you weren't standing on your toes. You probably stretch out your toes when you come. Maybe that's what it, whatever it is, but I know it's it's totally that, different. That would that would it's for totally you standing the, on them would emphasize that because your weight would be on your toes. Um, but no, you, you should you should definitely like try you know, it, guys. come and, and see. We're gonna have a sex show going here. I, that's interesting because. I mean, it's it's not talked about. A lot of things that people are afraid to talk about. It's one of the reasons why I have my advertisement for the show is from the A list to the triple X list to come on the show. Uh huh. Because you know, it's, everybody has a method and a, and, a, and a voice, and and it's nice to talk about things that are not being talked about. You know, one of the things I noticed about when I come. <laughs> In case you didn't know, uh, sometimes when um, sometimes what happens, God, I've never ever talked about this. This is a secret, okay? Sometimes what happens when I'm having sex is that all of a sudden I will get a cramp in my leg, like just and and the pain of that cramp actually is what drives me over the edge to coming. Yeah. So the pain, you, you enjoy pain. I enjoy pain. And so, uh, or a cramp in my foot, like in my toes. So it's like all of a sudden, you know, it's like I'm making love and I'm getting excited. And then all of a sudden I notice that I have this severe cramp in my foot, my toes, my calf. And, and all of a sudden I'm like coming really, really hard. So it's sort of like how it works for me. I understand what you're saying because it's funny. I, I, well, the whips and all that, like I said, I'm not interested in that. I don't think. I, but I do know, like a lot of times in the shower, I'll make it as hot as I can. It burns uh -huh. for a minute, and then it feels good. Yeah. You know that pain, and I, that's what made me think about. There, the there's a fine that. edge between, and and people have different types of pain that they like. Not everyone's liking of pain or whatever that that edge of the knife. Not everyone's is the same. It's very individualistic. But there is a dance. Uh, like some people like thuddy pain. Some people like sharp pain. Some people like heat. Whatever it is. But there is a dance on the top of a sword between pain and eroticism. And if you can find that, not only can you sustain your coming uh, or your, you know, getting up to that edge of coming, but having it feel so fantastic, and then and then tipping, you know, over to the edge. But yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, well, I've never got the eroticism, but it, and the pain. I mean, I just, it's very curious that if if that's where it's going to go. I mean, it, I've it's come just, just by having people flog me, but I think that it it's not all the time. See, this is the thing: is that people, for me, I think what it's about is people making a connection, and that it, that and that it's an energy. 
And so, but if I'm playing just BDSM with someone that I'm, I, I'm just really connected though with, you uh, know? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not like they're just hitting me, but I'm really connected. It's almost what like do you mean there's by not a, hitting you? Um, 